to the Make an Impact podcast presented by the American Association of Suicidology. I'm Chris Cosentino, and today we're joined by the third place finisher of the 2023 Paul G. Quinette Lived Experience Writing Competition, Emily Bernier. Welcome to the podcast, Emily. Hi, thanks for having me. So congratulations and, and thank you for sharing your story. Uh, but before we get into the story, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and what inspires you to make an impact in this way? Yeah, uh, great questions to start with. Um, so my name, as you said, is Emily. Um, I'm 32 years old, uh, grew up in a small French town um, in Quebec, uh, which is in Canada, and kind of grew up in a rural environment that had too many people around, um, kind of moved all over the world, I guess. Uh, lived in Panama in Central America for several years um, and then moved back to Canada and moved out west. And I'm currently in Calgary, Alberta, which I call home and absolutely adore. And right now, uh, stage in my career, I am a clinical research coordinator end goal or life goal is to go into clinical psychology and essentially do some work in the mental health field. So that kind of ties into a big reason as to why I wrote the essay and why I want to do the work I want to do. Um, so I don't know, there'll be more questions about um, kind of more the specifics, but um, big reason for me writing this is that in our field um, of psychology, uh, we have to do some pretty lengthy graduate school application processes and you write uh, statement letters where you talk a little bit about your reason for wanting to pursue psychology, but everyone tells you to hide and not be yourself. Um, you're basically told not to talk about any lived experience um, as being a motivating factor for you pursuing studies because um, they see it as kind of like a weakness or um, that you can't manage or handle stressors uh, well. And um, I'm a big, big, big proponent of having peer support, having people with lived experience help other people um, that are going through it. Um, you just have a little bit more of that understanding and better opportunity to empathize with others. Um, so just kind of putting myself out there. Um, I want to make a change in that um, and make it less stigmatized. <laughs> but long, long answer to your, your short question. <laughs> No, I appreciate that. And I'm curious, I mean, at AAS, we we really value the importance of being a, a global organization and, and the resources that we provide are not just in the U.S., but, but worldwide. I'm curious to get your opinion on what mental health looks like in Canada and what, uh, you know, what the efforts have been to uh, work on suicide prevention. Yeah, so... Across Canada, it'll vary um, province by province. I'm sure it's the same in the States, right? Um, some provinces are more inclined to do stuff for mental health. Some are less. Um, I'm in Alberta, which is a pretty conservative um, province in terms of like leanings. Um, so mental health is not one of the huge priorities, but the city I am in, um, is actually <laughs> a less conservative leaning um, city and does have a good um, kind of like game plan to address mental health and stuff. Um, I actually know that because I do work part time for the city. <laughs> so um, I know they, they're doing a lot of work to um, address that, address uh, homelessness, um, addiction, um, kind of those big picture items and one of those top priorities. Um, my university is huge um, in terms of the stuff it's trying to do. Um, 
to improve mental health on campus. They have a whole strategy in play. Um, I actually work with a PhD student that is um, developing a suicide uh, stigma uh, reduction program. Um, so a lot of efforts are going in to uh, kind of destigmatize mental health, um, get more people talking about it kind of openly, um, and, and putting those supports in place for for other people. There's a lot of like uptake on peer supporting, right, um, and just having other people support each other with that kind of lived experience. You know, I, I feel you, compassion, um, just people peopling with each other, <laughs> I suppose. Um, and, and knowing that um, you're not alone in this, right? Sometimes it's helpful to see someone that looks like you, um, like whether you're an 18 year old or you're uh, a different culture, just to have someone that you can resonate with, I think is, is huge. But overall, at least where I'm situated, I feel pretty good. Um, can speak for all the provinces in, in Canada, and it just it varies so widely. Um, Canada is usually pretty progressive. <laughs> we like to think we are, <laughs> um, but it's really, it's so dependent. You titled your story, Out of the Echoes of Darkness, From Suicidal Thoughts to Graduate Aspirations. Was that an easy title to come up with? Did you have other titles in mind? No, uh, it was it was not at all um, easy. I think titles are one of the things I struggle the most with. Um, and I did really want to touch on those echoes, right, um, that I touch on in my story, um, because it is very much what my experience was like. It, it felt like there was a voice, but not a voice. It was like an inner monologue type of thing that I was constantly battling with and like it was like an actual war going on in my head um and at that time there wasn't like a good side to it it was just like a one-sided battle right there was no one fighting against the the good voice because there was no good voice in my head it was just um negative and scary and dark uh, I mean, to like first experience that at nine years old when you are the epitome of a happy, like perfect child. Like that's how people describe me as a kid, right? I would just want to put a smile on everyone's face because I was polite, I was considerate. I just, I just wanted to like make people happy. But I think a lot. <laughs> Maybe you lose track of, yeah, you want to make other people happy, but what about yourself? Um, when do you factor in? But I don't think nine-year-olds think that way. <laughs> I think you only start realizing that when you're a bit older. Um, and so having that first, that first voice creep in, just on a regular, regular everyday, kind of like walking through the halls, it's just so solidified in my memory because it shook me to my core. Like you, you almost have to like shake it off because there's this weird feeling that comes with it. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I really wanted to touch on that in my title. Um, and I, I think the graduate aspirations is also uh, important to my story because um, like I said, it is something that is extremely stigmatized which is so contradictory for the field of psychology you would think right like we want people to get help we want people to get better that's that's what the field is about but we're doing the exact opposite <laughs> of, of what's going to make people want to get help and want to reach out um if you're instilling in the minds of these future psychologists that it's not okay to uh, have experienced uh, mental health concerns or suicidality. Um, how, how does that get internalized when you're treating other people, right? Um, and I think that's where work needs to be done. And I want to shake it up a bit. <laughs> so I think that was really important to my title too, but it, it definitely took a little bit of time of sitting there and how do we incorporate both, both aspects? 
No, I love that. And, and I had the absolute pleasure of, of reading all 125 submissions before they went on to our panel of judges. And the one through line that I really saw that consistent message through all the stories was that writing was almost a cathartic experience. Did you feel that? Did you feel that writing your story and sharing it was therapeutic for you? And, and if so, how? 100%. Um, I was actually just talking to my supervisor about this um, yesterday is that I'm pretty open with my, like w w with my surroundings, with peers and stuff about my experiences with mental health. I do kind of like, depending on my, on my audience, I guess, right. <laughs> kind of hold back some things. You don't know safety, like who's safe to disclose what to. Um, but I, even in the people I feel safe with, I've always just shared snippets, right? Like, I'll let you know this, I'll sprinkle this in. Um, don't want to overwhelm them with this, however many <laughs> years of, um, experience I've had with like these thoughts and ideas and behaviors. Um, and so when I was able to get everything out, it felt like, Instead of sharing bits and pieces, I could share my full self. Um, and I think that was huge for me. Um, letting that mask down and just being your full authentic self. And I, I really pride myself on that authenticity and just trying to be who you are <laughs> like I mean we're so much of the world is uh, like first impressions or what people think of you and um you know what this is a part of me this is who's like what has made me who I am today and I would not be where I am today without having experienced um those things and it's a huge huge reason into um, why I want to go into the field I want to go to, right? Because somehow against all odds, like I managed to get out of that. And now I can see kind of the other side of things. Yeah, the thoughts still come in like now and then. Um, I don't know if they'll ever fully um, be gone, but it is something that I'm cognizant of now. And like, I kind of know when they come in. Um, but being able to recognize that, being able to share my story in its kind of full, full scope um, has been huge, um, really huge for me. Because, yeah, instead of people just getting bits and pieces of me, um, they can get kind of a more <laughs> put together understanding um, and see where I'm coming from and understand a little better uh, why I am who I am today. No, I love that. And, and reading your story and, and all the other ones, it's, it's, I wanted more, you know, I didn't want the stories to end. I wanted to keep going. And um, it's, it's really one of these experiences where it's like, okay, I can't wait for the next chapter, you know, and, and they continue to grow with one another. In your story, you discuss being ho hospitalized on multiple occasions. I'm curious to know like what, what those experiences were like, um, you know, when you talk about, now you have the ability to kind of recognize those triggers that might, you know, were you able to learn those types of things in, in, when you're being hospitalized yeah. through therapy? I'm curious to see how you've gotten to where you are today. So that is a great question that I'm not sure I've totally figured out myself yet. Um, hospital experiences, absolutely terrible. <laughs> Don't rec like thinking back. I, I I can't really um think of one experience that was good. Um, even within the mental health field, like in hospitals, unfortunately, um, there is still a lot of stigmatization and there's a little bit of victim blaming too. Um, I remember like one of the experiences I had. Um, I was just kind of chastised. Um for what I had done and like kind of like a kid getting like punished um and it was really not a great feeling <laughs> so I don't know if the kind of accumulation of like 
being through that um, kind of system has was a little bit of a deterrent for sure. Maybe not at, at first, but um, definitely the last experience I had um, was one that kind of shook me and I was like, okay, um, don't really want to be here <laughs> again. Um, but also, how, how do I do that? Right. Um, and it was really just, I think just day by day, taking it day by day. And I, I'm going to say this every day until uh, like I go to the grave at 90 some years old. Right. Um, support relationships, have one stable person in your life. Um, whether that's a partner, whether that's a friend, um, doesn't matter who it is, just one person who has that stability, one person who accepts you for who you are, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, who won't judge you when you're having those hard moments. Um, easier said than that, though. <laughs> it's hard to find that person. Um, so I wish I could magically create someone for everyone. Um, that would be the magic here, I think. Um, but in my, in my experience, um, that was the biggest um, medicine, I think, in um, getting quote unquote better um, was just knowing how, no matter how kind of ugly it got, they would still be there um through it all and I acknowledge that definitely not easy to be on the receiving end of that uh so major props to my partner there <laughs> for that um there's other thing I, I would recommend if you can um get a dog get a dog <laughs> if you don't have a human get a dog um there's just something about um being able to be your authentic self and not being judged. Um, my dog does have some judgy faces sometimes, so I don't, I can't really tell you. <laughs> She's not always judging me. Um, and if you can, um, therapist. So I think the biggest strides in my mental health have probably been in the last three years. Um, and it wasn't because I was dealing with suicidal thoughts or anything. I was actually in a better spot than I had ever been. But that just kind of goes to show that um, mental health isn't just when you're not doing well, right? Um, it's all times. And I think getting on top of it before it gets bad is huge. Um, cause then you start thinking about what you're feeling, why you're feeling it. You have a little bit more of that introspection and a little bit more clarity on why you might be feeling the way you are or why these thoughts are coming in. Um, and how to kind of manage any impulses that might come up or anything like that. Um, it can be really hard, especially if something terrible happens, right? Uh, someone who's like struggled with suicidal thoughts and behaviors for um, 32 now, uh, nine, 20, 20, 23 years. Uh, like it's so easy to fall back into that, um, way of thinking because it's been so cemented with so many years um but being able to recognize that and have a little bit of that um buzzword here um, emotional intelligence i think is huge um so even like even just getting a therapist before things are not bad i think is huge um because you can just talk through things um, and finding a therapist you vibe with. If you don't vibe with someone on the first, like, just ditch them. Um, the biggest thing is finding someone you can be yourself with and you feel comfortable with. So don't, um, don't feel bad about um, firing a psychologist. Everyone needs a specific type of person. Um, and that's my big thing is that it took me so long to find someone I was comfortable with. Um, but I don't think there's any shame in that. Like everyone needs something different. I need someone that's going to validate me. Someone might not, someone might need that like tough love type of thing. Um, so there's so many people out there and someone will fit your needs, I suppose. Um, 
I guess those are my, there's no solid answers. For me, medicine wasn't a big help. Um, tried a lot of different medications and they weren't great. Um, so I did stop taking those um, and really just kind of focus on that inner healing. Um, sounds cliche. I'm not a yogi or anything like that. <laughs> um, but really just kind of trying to find that peace within. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't have the, the best, most like solid, direct answer. <laughs> it's pretty well, I don't big. Think any, I don't think anybody does, right? Yeah. Like everyone's different. Everyone's going through a different journey. And, yeah. you know, I think everyone just has to really have that opportunity to look at themselves in the mirror and, and have the courage and have the willingness to want to make a change and, mm -hmm. and reach out for help. Um, Definitely. I'm curious, you know, I mean, your story, you do such a great job in creating this timeline of mm -hmm. starting from when you were a kid to present day. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know what, you know, right now, what would you say to your nine-year-old self? My nine-year-old self. Oh, that's a good question. Cause my nine-year-old self wasn't outwardly struggling with suicidal thoughts i don't think i could have identified it as that at that time but that you don't belong thing that came into my mind that i didn't deserve to be there that i shouldn't be there that was scary i think if i could like go back in time and like talk to little emily um i'd probably just be like hey like you know that thought you had um like tell one of your friends about it or like maybe not your friend maybe like a teacher I think a teacher might have been um safer um thing or your parents if you're feeling comfortable right um even just saying it or like <sighs> letting someone know <laughs> that that's that's kind of going can not raise some flags that's not how I want to frame it but just be like okay she's you know she had this thought maybe we check in a little bit more often right um maybe we don't just leave it um I think that's probably the biggest thing that I would tell her well tell at what age did you start doing therapy wow well, uh there so I had one experience with therapy, uh, it was like mandated therapy when I was, I think I was 14, 15. Um, and um, that's when I kind of got quote unquote caught um, self-harming. Um, some of my friends had realized that, you know, I had cuts on my arms and whatnot. And they told one of the counselors at school. And so I got called in and it, this really felt like I was in trouble. Like I was in, like, straight A student, never got in trouble. I'm getting called into the office. Um, and then this counselor was just, I don't, I don't know um, how much experience he had uh, in dealing with self-harm or, or suicide, but I don't think the approach was the best because he scared, he scared me so bad. He's like, you know, if we don't tell your parents, I'm going to get people to come take you away from your family. And I was like, Oh my God, like, what am I going to do? Um, so it was really like this, this fear. And I think that made things worse for me, honestly, because it, it made me more, get more creative <laughs> in hiding and not getting found out. Um, so that kind of like scare tactic mm -mm, does not work. Uh, my friends, it does not work. Um, uh, you <laughs> need <laughs> A different approach, um, especially for teenagers, because teenagers are sneaky. Um, that was probably my first experience. So I like I ended up going to um, just like a family therapist because we had to or else it's going to get taken away. Um, and I was just so scared um, and I didn't want to go again um, if it wasn't someone I chose either. Right. Um, you're 14 years old. Your parents going to choose the therapist you will see. Mm -hmm. so I just lied. Yeah. <laughs> just lied. Through my teeth. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm just sad. My grandpa died. Okay. And that was it. And then I just got unfortunately better at hiding my thoughts and <sighs> changing my methods, I guess. Um and just 
not being found out and telling people less, right? Um, and I, I don't know, I don't, I can't remember if I like told my friend or they like found out. I can't quite remember. That's still a little bit fuzzy. Um, but it definitely shut me down a little bit, that fear. Um, and I think in the long run, that did me a lot of damage because then everything kind of just piled up and up and up and up over time um, until the next time I had to go to therapy, um, also mandated. <laughs> so um, that next time was a lot better, thankfully. Um, the psychologist I had was amazing in that time and that was in Panama. Um, absolutely loved her. Um, and that was a great experience. That was the opposite of the other experiences I had. Um, it was someone I vibed with, um, very supportive, calm demeanor, validating, right? Not telling me that what I'm thinking is wrong, what I'm feeling is wrong. Um, and I think that was huge for me because when I was going through that kind of mandated therapy, I was also seeing a psychiatrist who was the complete opposite of that. And I think if I had just been seeing her, um, it would have probably just prolonged that, you know, not getting help or getting therapy. Um, and when I moved back to Canada and had, unfortunately, more attempts and stuff, um, I, I didn't find anyone for the longest time. Um, to help me through that because I didn't click with people. I didn't trust them. I felt kind of demeaned or spoken down to at times. Um, and I think if I hadn't had that good experience with that one therapist in Panama, I might have completely lost hope that it was possible that there'd be someone that I, I fit with. Um, but just knowing that there was kind of opened me up to it again and then yeah like in 2020 I was like you know what like things aren't terrible they're fine um I'm, I'm doing way better than I I usually uh or have been in the past and then I just started seeing her and it's been three years <laughs> no, I, three I, years I, uh I, longest I, longest relationship with a therapist there <laughs> no, I appreciate you sharing that story and I think what it does, is it really shines a light on the importance of education and not just, you know, with school staff, for example, or, yeah. or example, or counselors, but even students, you mentioned that your, your friends were the ones that noticed something off. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think if we're all working together, you know, your peers, because if you think about it, your friends are with you more yeah. than teachers or your parents, because, especially now with social media, your friends are in the chat rooms with you. Your friends are out mm -hmm. with you socially. They, they're more aware of the relationships that you might be having and that you might not be able to open up to an adult yeah. about, or they just might not be aware of. So I, I really, once again, this is one of the big things that AAS we're, we're all about training and trying to find these great courses. But I think there really needs to continue to be that focus on, providing information for your peers to what are the signs to look for 100 percent with you on that um i think looking now and like my my time in high school um things at, at least in canada have shifted quite dramatically like um kids know about mental health now um i feel like they're having more open conversations which is huge um I think back in the day when I was in high school, um, we didn't know how to how to approach that, right? What the right way, wrong way is of doing, of supporting someone who might be having um, suicidal thoughts or behaviors, right? Um, and I think we, we have come a long way that it's slow, but... The kids, the youth, um, it's where it's at. They're, they're woke. <laughs> um, I think we still need to do a lot of work with um, the medical professionals. Huge amount of work. 
with medical professionals. Um, the stuff I've heard come out of their, some, some people's mouths um, has just like kind of rattled me to my core um, to the point where I'm like, wow, I can't, I can't disclose any of my past to these people because they're, they're not safe. And these are, these are people who have lives in their hands, right? Um, and it is so stigmatized, so, so stigmatized. Um, I remember talking to one doctor who told me something along the lines that, you know, I'm not going to help someone who's suicidal because uh, they don't even want to live. And I was like, oh, okay, this is someone who's responsible for children's lives, um, does not instill a lot of confidence. Um, I think there needs to be so much work done in the medical field um, and not play, placing blame on anything. It's just how the education has been and kind of creating this dichotomy of good and bad and there's no kind of in between, right? Um, I think that's what we need to target because as a society, we look up to medical doctors, right? There are people of status, there are people of power, we trust them. Um, but if they're holding these kinds of thoughts, um, <laughs> if the people whose lives we put our hands in um, think this way, it's hard to shift that culture. Um, and I think schools, at least across Canada, are, are doing a great job um, of talking about mental health. But I mean, it's a work in progress all, all, all across the board, right? Always is. Always is. Yeah. And finally, what advice do you have for other people who might be on that same road that you've been mm -hmm. on? Yeah. Um, so the road to recovery, I guess, hey? Um, I think that advice to the ones that are currently going through it. And this is going to be so cliche, and I hate that it's coming out of my mm -hmm. mouth. Um, but I'm going to follow up with kind of an action plan of <laughs> how it can be maybe less cliche is just, um, just take it day by day. I know that sometimes, um, it literally feels like there is no way out, um, that nothing will get better. It like, I have 100% been there where I saw no hope none whatsoever. There was not the sliver of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I, I couldn't even wrap my head around a life that didn't look the way I was feeling. That constant negativity, that like willingness to not be alive. Like I was just so certain that if I was not alive, I would not feel this way. And I could not see any other option to not feeling that way um but here i am like how many years later and yeah things are actually pretty good um and, and that's a huge thing for me because i i wish i could just go back in time and and shake myself and be like i promise things will get better. Like I promise, but you hear that from everyone. That's the thing, right? You hear that from everyone and then it, it doesn't get better. And you're like, when's it going to get better? <laughs> um, I think the big thing through that is finding someone else who's been there. Find someone who's been there that can reassure you that it's freaking hard. It is so hard and you have to fight and swim every day and it's tiring it is so tiring but when you get out on the other side and you're like wow i i went through all of that and here i am today maybe i can help someone else who's going through that maybe i can give them that little bit of hope that you know yeah things suck they suck and they can stack up and suck and suck and suck some more. Um, and you can fail to find the happiness or the good points. Cause I get that. I get that, man. Like 
how how do you find the joy or the good things in anything when all you see is the bad that's going on in your life um but it's really just as tiring as it is keep swimming people do care about you um even though it seems like they might they might do everything wrong people care um and i think even just having I don't know, maybe let's set up a support group for <laughs> other people who have lived experience. Maybe that's the answer is just to have someone else to talk to when you really don't have that hope anymore. And I think, yeah, that's that's what I say to the ones going through it now. It's like, dude, I've been there and I promise it's so hard and you're going to feel like I'm lying to you, but I'm not it. It will eventually let up. But and when it does, it's great. Whole different world, right? Opens a whole bunch of doors and you'll you'll be at this point in your life where you're so much more resilient than most people. You've been through all these things and you have a different outlook on life. Um and you have more compassion for others. Um and I think that's huge. Well, I, I think you you ended your story the way I, I would like to end this this conversation. And, and you saying that we are fighters. I'm a fighter. By your side, I will fight for you. And and I love that. I love the way you, you closed out your story. Emily, I, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your inspiring story. And please, please, please keep making an impact because you are helping so many. Thank you so much. I am so appreciative of having the chance to be here and kind of get my voice out there and, and let other people know, you know, you're not alone. Um, other people who look exactly like you, someone out there is going through the same thing. And um, it does. It does get better.